What do the NASA astronauts see that they're not telling us? They show up on multiple radar simultaneously. They leave evidences behind like radiation and burnt ground and what have you. And so they're real. We've seen that astronauts like White, Armstrong, and Grissom have gone before Congress to actually indicate that they themselves had witnessed what they could only describe as extraterrestrial activity. What we're going to look at here is the information on hyperspaces and how limited we really are to this aspect of reality. This might give us some detailed clues of how these UFO phenomena really work and where they really come from. AI is not limited to uh, UFO or alien understanding. We humans need to understand these UFO and uh, alien phenomena in order to incorporate it to artificial intelligence. Are UFO entities a malevolent threat to mankind? What is the government hiding about the quantum physics understanding of the UFO phenomenon? Well, first of all, this whole area of UFOs is widely confused and misunderstood. And there, it's probably one of the most difficult areas to get an uh, uh, understanding of because there are so many false reports, so many hoaxes, so much nonsense. When you scrub that all away, though, you're faced with the reality that there are thousands of competent, well-documented observations that have a basic paradox to them. On the one hand, they're real. They show up on multiple radars simultaneously. They leave evidences behind like radiation and burnt ground and what have you. And so they're real. They possess the skills and ability to transcend and travel through and jump across dimensions so they can pop in and out at will into different dimensions that exist within the same low. With any same structure, you may have multiple dimensions that intersect. On the other hand, at the same time, they violate physical laws. They make right angle turns at incredible speeds that, uh, that are, are beyond explaining. Uh, they appear to be, they seem to be able to materialize and disappear at will. They're in multiple uh, formations. There, we, there are special classified studies that determine they're piloted by intelligent, you know, sentient beings. So there's the paradox. There's some things that are clearly true on the one hand and clearly unexplainable on another. We as mortal men are trapped into one dimension. It's the dimension that we live in. It has all the rules of physics uh, are constructed in such that they work for us within the dimension we're in. These other entities, they'll pop in and out at will 
When we see some of them, we think they're spirits, we think they're reincarnated individuals, we think that they're ghosts, and, and, and they're, they're, in my opinion, these are demonic entities that choose to materialize within our dimension and then dematerialize and go back to whatever dimension they're from. Now I want to take a look at some very interesting information that Dr. Missler covered in his DVD series, Return in the Nephilim. And what we are going to look at here is the information on hyperspaces and how limited we really are to this aspect of reality. This might give us some detailed clues of how these UFO phenomena really work and where they really come from. Angelic beings, extraterrestrials, occupy a different dimension. In the world of science, we have different dimensions that are part of what we call a loaf. Well, just like bread, each slice of the bread occupies another dimension. Extraterrestrial entities, heavenly entities, occupy a certain domain that is a dimension within the loaf. Now, when we're getting into the study of hyperspaces, what this simply means is that we are studying spaces of more than three dimensions. In doing so, what we find is that there are only two kinds of people that can relate or deal with perceptions of hyperspaces. Those people are mathematicians with specialized training and small children. They are able to relate to hyperspaces because their prejudices are blindfolded, so to speak. The common thinking today is that they're transdimensional. And uh, now that gets into a whole discussion of our physical reality in the first place. And it's hard to deal with this in a sophisticated way because most people haven't studied this in a serious way. So let me back up a little bit. If we take things that are larger than ourselves, and I'll call that the macrocosm, that gets you in the study of astronomy and the universe at whole. The, one of the things, the great discovery of 20th century science is that the universe is finite. It may be expanding, but it's finite. It's not infinite. That has, stagger, that has staggering implications. I'll come back to that. Now, most of us have heard of Euclid. This is from where we were taught mathematics in school. If we look into certain aspects of trigonometry, we know that any triangle will only add up to 180 degrees. So let's suppose that we all went out to a very large field, and with a transit, we carefully laid out a very huge triangle. So when we get back and we add up our figures, we then realize that this large triangle added up to more than 180 degrees. Well, you might conclude that we messed up on our calculations of this very large triangle. However, the truth is that we have encountered something known as the curvature of the Earth. If you go the other way, in terms of smallness, there's a limit to smallness, and this is, the, this is even stranger yet. If I took a piece of string and cut it in half, I could take what's left and cut it in half. And you would think, at least conceptually, whatever I had left, I could always cut it in half. I might not be able to do it physically, but I could do it conceptually. It turns out that if I get down to 10 to the minus 35 centimeters and try to cut that in half, the thing I'm cutting in loses vo locality. It's everywhere at the same time. There's a property physicists call, they call it non-locality. Whether you're talking about length, mass, uh, time, or energy, they're all made up of indivisible units. You get down to the point you can't get smaller than. The point is we discover our physical universe is digital. It's made up of indivisible units. You see, if you take a course in navigation, one of the things you have to become very familiar with is something called spherical trigonometry. This is the aspect of mathematics that can actually make a triangle add up to more than 180 degrees. You see, the one rule that we have learned that a triangle only adds up to 180 degrees is only true to a universe of two dimensions. So anytime you find a rule that violates certain mathematics, this is a hint that you have encountered an additional dimensionality. Dr. Albert Einstein created and made history in 1905 with his theory of special relativity, which was nothing more than a calculation that length, mass, velocity, and time are relative to the velocity of the observer. Now that gives us a very, very peculiar problem. 
there's a limit to smallness and there's a limit to largeness. You can't go to infinity in either direction. You can't get smaller than certain dimensions, whether you're talking about, depending on the units you're talking about. What we discover is, and I'm quoting from Scientific American, June of 2005, an article about the constants of physics which are changing, and if they're changing, and they are, their words, that implies that our physical reality is a shadow of a larger reality. Then 10 years later, he generalized this theory of relativity. This is where he basically discovered that there is no distinction between time and space. So, one of the most important things that we realize from Einstein's theory is that time itself is a physical property. We realize that we do not live in three dimensions, but at the very least we exist in four. In fact, we now know that there are many more dimensionalities that exist. Einstein's theory has been confirmed by over 12 different methods to over 14 decimals. So, this is a well-accepted basis in mathematics. I agree with Einstein. I believe that Einstein's special relativity is exactly valid when we are talking about the masses or objects or even uh, of even craft or even a spaceship that can be well approximated as being massive point. This is the case for um, a craft that is uh, undergoing interplanetary travel. Uh, there are necessary there has to be a form of space anomaly because the, the, the distances are, are just excessive and cannot be reached through the laws of uh, special relativity. Otherwise, it will take uh, forever for a craft to reach um, the Vega star or the Capella. Now, let's go beyond Euclid, which only deals with three dimensions. If we go back to 1854, a man by the name of George Riemann gave an astonishing lecture that proved to be of extreme importance. He invented an awesome thing called metric tensors. This tool that he helped develop has proven to be one of the most profound tools in advanced physics. This was the very tool that Dr. Einstein used to develop his four-dimensional space-time. There is not, this is the teaching by Einstein that I believe, <clears throat> that there, there cannot be a space anomaly unless there is jointly a time anomaly. In other words, you cannot have a space anomaly while time remains the same. It's impossible. <clears throat> Einstein, that's Einstein conception. Uh, we have to honor Einstein. It is true. If what, what is the consequence? The consequence? The consequence is that a craft capable of performing interstellar travel necessarily must be a, a tra craft performing travel in time. You know, well, you cannot uh, the, so that if it leaves at the, if it leaves, let's say, the Vega star at a certain value in time, then uh, it will not reach in, it reaches here after 10 of our days. Its time will not be 10, 10 days later. No, no way. It can be thousands of years forward or thousands of years in the past, in the past. Space time are often used together. Space, look at, if you look at it, it's a, a container that, of that instance or occurrences. And time, it's a snapshot of space and that, uh, that encapsulate the instance and occurrences. So think of, uh, time and space as a frame-by-frame frame snapshot of all events and occurrences that uh, appears at a single space or multiple space. So this is one of the biggest mystery of the interstellar travel because it implies necessarily a space, a travel not only space but also in time, which is usually this the travel in time is ignored because it raises issue of causality, uh, because if you go backward in time and then you land on Earth and you change the future of Earth, you know the, you know the <laughs> back to the future. And um, however, there are uh, there are ways in which the in which the, the um, in which, for instance, holograms traveling backward in time can observe um, can observe life, uh, can observe event way backward in time, but being a hologram, not, they have no capability of in, interf in, 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 uh, interfering. With, um, with the law of with reality. Um, it could be transverse within a, um, two distances, or it could be that same site. But uh, that spatial uh, temporal dynamics, uh, or that snapshot of 
the events that occur within that space and time can be singular upon one space or it can uh, transverse from a mini space such as Florida to DC. Do UFO entities exist outside our time-space domain? How do the UFO entities work within our physical universe? Why don't known laws that govern our universe apply to UFOs? In 1953, several four-dimensional models were developed by Kaluza and Klein that dealt with light and supergravity. These actual models will give us some clues in the future about these UFO technologies we will be describing. As we continue down this historic trail, we will see that in 1963, Yang and Mills fields were developed in the area of electromagnetic and nuclear forces. This was the beginning genesis of the development to electromagnetic graphitics that also explains this future technology that we find within this UFO phenomenon. Finally, around 1984, the superstring conjecture came into the picture. Even though there are still many problems with the string theory, scientists do believe that we live not in three or four, but rather ten dimensionalities. Therefore, in the stationary universe by uh, Einstein, Hubble, Hoyle, Zwicky, Fermi, De Broglie, and so, uh, so many other famous scientists, there is the necessity to have an antimatter galaxy because um, only in that case, due to the gravitational repulsion between the uh, matter um, um, galaxy and antimatter galaxy, Now, we really can't go into other dimensions. We cannot go up without the aid of high-level mathematics. However, what we can do is stretch our imagination and show a rather cool illustration that might convey other dimensions from our point of observation. So let's imagine that there is a two-dimensional world, a world that, so to speak, that exists on a flat piece of paper. Now let's imagine that this two-dimensional world is populated by two-dimensional people. You and I could come along and poke our finger through this flat plane of their two-dimensional reality. In doing so, what they would see is a circle that would pop out of nowhere. They would only see that which they could relate to in their two-dimensional universe. Then we have indeed a realistic quantitative possibility of achieving stability of the universe. Not only that, but explicit calculation, not conjecture, but explicit calculation have shown, have proven that the presence of antimatter ga galaxy in the universe is the reason for the very la large distances in between all galaxies in the universe. Now, let's imagine that a ball fell through or passed through their two-dimensional universe. From their perspective of these two-dimensional people in that two-dimensional universe, what they would see is nothing to a point, then it would grow to a large circle, then it would shrink back down to a point and then disappear. They would not be able to relate to what happened because they do not have the insight of that third dimension. In regards to, look, uh, to uh, actually the different dimensionality, what we're really concerned about is the location within that dimensionality. So as long as you have some mapping uh, uh, reference or some gadget or something that identify the location of whatever dimensionality you have, then we'll be able to uh, be able to pinpoint location to that dimensionality. If we had some other shape, let's say a tumbling cube, it would also pass through their two-dimensional plane. From their point of observation, it would take on all sorts of weird and distorted shapes as it passed through their two-dimensional world and disappeared. Dr. Missler brings up these examples that would go into what we might be observing with these shape-shifting UFO phenomena that may very well be passing in and out of our three- and four-dimensional time space. So dimensionality is important to understand in terms of how that uh, how that dimensionality is projected 
but once you get that projection then all of a sudden we could still um, do whatever we did with a map and add location to that dimensionality so that way we could correctly place sites or events that occurred. This brings up a very interesting problem that we would encounter with this two-dimensional world. Let's suppose that you and I wanted to communicate a three-dimensional object to this two-dimensional world. Well, how would we go about it? There are a couple of ways. One way to go about this would be to do what an architect would call a projection. If we had a cube, we could shine a light on that cube and its shadow would be cast onto that two-dimensional world. It would give a profile of that cube. What quantum mechanics and uh, physics call locality, non-locality, or just locality in general, we call sight. In geography, you can uh, go down to the most smallest detail or most uh, level that's really specific to humankind, such as a house a development. So, but when dealing with other organisms, that level of detail might go down even further. Now, you would find that this works to a degree. However, it does not really convey to those two-dimensional people all the aspects of this three-dimensional cube. There is another way that we can do this. We can take a three-dimensional cube and unravel it. We could then lay it out onto the two-dimensional universe. This would kind of be a way of communicating to this two-dimensional person what this three-dimensional cube is like. Alien intervention an alien presence is very much like looking at a two-dimensional sheet of paper and watching the shadow of a Rubik's cube. It's kind of hard at first, unless that cube is spinning, to give a 3D definition to the objects to such an extent that the onlooker would be able to understand it. It could be done. However, it's a two-dimensional image that you're trying to uh, understand a three-dimensional reality from. However, you will quickly learn that as you do this, this two-dimensional person's understanding would still be incomplete. Again, you might ask, Gary, what does all of this have to do with these UFO phenomenon? Well, follow along as we go just a little bit further in this example. Dr. Missler does an extraordinary example rating here of how to relate from these UFO phenomenon and other dimensionalities to our fourth time dimensionality. We have that three-dimensional Rubik's Cube going through that two-dimensional space. It would completely take on unusual characteristics and it would give further understanding to the truth of the dimension of the three-dimensional Rubik's Cube. It wouldn't be portrayed in just a two-dimensional fashion. It would take on all types of shapes that will, would be morphing in that two-dimensional world. And that would give an alternate form of reality as well. So let's try to paint a very clear picture with our three-dimensional limitations. As a matter of fact, many of these UFO sightings may very well be objects or windows in higher dimensions that are passing through our fourth dimensional space. This would explain a great deal of these UFO sightings that are reported throughout the universe. Even if the locality is an atom or a molecule or an organism, the site or the locality, I should say, can only be broken down to its most detailed level based on that uh, organic or non-organic uh, um, instance. As a matter of fact, many of these UFO sightings may very well be objects or windows in higher dimensions that are passing through our fourth dimensional space-time. This would explain why many of the UFO sightings reported unidentified objects that take on all distorted and changing shapes morphing shapes that pass in and out and disappear. This is the whole concept to me of understanding the dimension with the understanding that the human body on the subatomic level, the distance between the nucleus of an atom where the proton and the nucleus exists and the outer electron of any atom, the space that's between that is so huge, a lot of things can actually occur so let's take this a step further. Let's talk about a four-dimensional cube. This is known as a tesseract, the unraveled Hinton cube. This is a four-dimensional cube unraveled into three dimensions. 
Dr. Chuck Nistler points this out in one place. You might find it very interesting that there's a certain artist who illustrated this cube in one of his pieces of art. As a matter of fact, this piece of art showed a high level of mathematical understanding and higher dimensionality. This piece of art is a four-dimensional cube with Christ hovering or hanging on top of its structure. It's as though Christ was not bound or limited any space or time dimensionality. The artist who created this complex piece of art is none other than Salvador Dali. Between that space, the distance is immense, and I could go into great detail about that with quantum physics and cellular biology and all these other things, but the thing, the takeaway here is that there's a lot of room for mischief in our dimension, our simple dimension, as simple as it is, gives a lot of room for a lot of mischief to occur. If we take the macrocosm as largeness and the microcosm as smallness, they both are limited. They are a shadow of something larger, and that something larger would be called the metacosm. If you go back to 1935, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen created what is known as the EPR paradox. This was a thought experiment in quantum mechanics that sort of demonstrates that the wave function does not provide a complete description of our reality. If you remember, this wave function does not fully explain light on its own. When we're talking about angels or UFOs or whatever, you're dealing with entities that are in the metacosm. They're not restricted to either subatomic particle ends on smallness or are they, nor are they contained within the limits of largeness. They're, all of this, our physical reality is a subset of something larger, and that's where these things that we're dealing with come from. Do these UFO phenomenon understand the principle of, of particle wave duality that we find in quantum mechanics? So if we take a look at this light wave particle duality, we might understand a higher level of this UFO technology. According to the Hubble law, namely according to our measurement of the redshift of, galactic, uh, of galaxy or galactic star, the redshift is the same for all galaxies at the same distance from Earth, but in all radial direction from Earth. So, do these UFO phenomena understand entangled particle theories? where particles are connected with one another. If we can understand this aspect of entangled particles, this might give us some clues as to how these UFOs work their new technological wonders. I repeat, in all radial direction from Earth. Therefore, Einstein, Hubble, Hoyle, Fermi, Dirac, De Broglie, they could not possibly accept the expansion of the universe because it implies a clear return to the Middle Ages with Earth at the center of the universe. This is a necessary consequence of the very fundamental Hubble law on the cosmological redshift. Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen may have discovered something very critical in their thought experiment that goes way beyond our understanding of technological advances of today. Their thought experiment of the EPR paradox may give us clues as to how these UFOs really work. Once the, the, the stationary universe by Einstein, Hoyle, Hubble, and all the other famous scientists is admitted, then there is a clear necessity to have antimatter galaxy as an essential part of the universe because of matter, antimatter uh, repulsion, gravitational repulsion. Why is our limited awareness and human perception so critical to our understanding of the UFO phenomena? 
If the electromagnetic spectrum is so vast, what then might really exist beyond our sight perception? So we know that light is both a wave and a particle. And in quantum mechanics, this is known as the wave-particle duality. Einstein once wrote about this duality when he stated very clearly that light has two different aspects to it. On the one hand, it's got the wave aspect, and on the other hand, it's got the particle aspect. But neither one of these two complements or fully explains on their own the aspect of light. But it's only when these two different aspects of light are integrated that light is fully explained. The concept of light being both waves and particle is an interesting one because uh, when you think of particle and wave, they're two different uh, uh, phenomena. And the thinking is that, that can a particle be a wave and can a wave be a particle? Or is it really that light is a particle that resembles elements of a wave? It seems as though we use sometimes the one wave theory and sometimes the other particle theory. While at times we may be using either, yet we are faced with a new kind of difficulty. We have two contradictory pictures of reality. Separately, neither of them fully explains the phenomenon of light, but together they do. When light comes into the atmosphere, it is broken up to uh, broken up into particles. And because of that particle being broken, it then um, gets absorbed, reabsorbed, or reflected to create what we see now as blue light, red light, or the environmental ambiance. Einstein mentioned that we have these two contradictory aspects or two binary images within light going on at the same time. On their own, a wave or a particle does not fully explain this reality of light. However, when you combine, coalesce these two properties at the same time, then the explanation of light makes full sense. Similarly, it's true that if we could microscopically or subatomically examine a particle or an atom, we would see that there is a vast chasm between the neutron and the electron that orbits that atom. The distance could be equally as profound from here to New York City. The amount of distance that actually is between the protons and neutrons and it's our electron that orbits that, that, that proton nucleus. Now we know that within this electromagnetic wave, light varies in frequency and thus this frequency determines its color. The visible spectrum of light ranges from 430 trillion hertz all the way to a staggering 750 trillion hertz. The complete frequency of the electromagnetic spectrum is way beyond our ability to monitor, observe, or detect with our naked eye. It only suggests that there's a lot of room for mischief to occur on the subatomic level. And it's for that reason that we know different things are going to manifest themselves towards the end of time that are involved with the hidden knowledge, the secret and hidden sciences that are not revealed to us yet, but are part of strong demonic activity and demonic mischief as the marvelous work of Satan is able to delve into some of these mysteries that we're just now scratching the surface to. So then, we can only observe or measure certain effects, as one of these effects is the changes to our optical interference patterns. This is exactly what David Bohm was using in the holonomic brain theory. There are the optical interference patterns that our minds may very well use to perceive our surrounding reality. Bohm stated that if we did not have lenses, eyes, telescopes, binoculars, etc., to observe this vast reality, the world would look like a blurred holograph. As I look at this vast 
field of the Everglades. I can't help but imagine the entire spectrum of the electromagnetic energy, which goes on endlessly. In fact, if we were to stretch a film strip representing that spectrum with individual frames, 20 per second, or about 20 frames per feet, and stretched it all the way from the Keys to Maine, the entire human perception of energy would only represent one frame out of that entire immense strip that stretches from the Keys all the way to Maine. Because what we're going to do is lay out very basic explanations of quantum mechanics, particle physics, and even neurology that will open your eyes to how limited we really are in our perception of reality. Then maybe, just maybe, you may start to understand clues and proposed ideas that could very well explain these UFO phenomenon. Only one frame out of a, an, an inordinate amount of information that stretches from the Keys all the way to Maine, and out of that 20 frame per foot, we could only perceive one frame. How much information goes completely undiscovered by modern man. It makes me think of the earlier man, the antediluvian, as well as Adam and Eve, the ability to see spectrums of light and energy that far exceed our narrow spectrum of light that occupies one tiny frame out of an immense strip. So if you have a film strip going all the way from Florida Keys, to Ming, and this film strip has 24 frames per foot. That's a lot of frames of pictures going that 2,200 miles. And this includes the, the requirement that uh, the antimatter light carries negative energy and evolves backward in time, again as a necessary condition for to allow a quantitative representation of matter-antimatter annihilation. I should remember in this connection that the British Nobel laureate Paul Dirac conceived uh, antimatter as being um, as possessing negative energy and, uh, and negative time. So I want to clarify that what we did has been merely extending uh, Dirac historical conception of antimatter from his definition of uh, characteristics of masses to the features of light. Quantum theory has proven that when particles are observed, they take on a completely different effect than when they're not observed, almost demonstrating an ability to go back in time and to alter its complete tra trajectory depending upon who is observing it and what point in time you're observing that particle. Could these UFOs literally be mas mastering particle energy to the point where they're actually slipping in and out of time slips and streams, going back through to and fro in time and manipulating time to their own advantage, much the same way that we've studied particles in quantum physics. In the 20th century, the conjugation from matter to antimatter was done by a mathematical operation known as charge conjugation which unfortunately was unable to, uh, to, uh, to allow a quantitative interpretation of the very mechanism at the foundation of the, at the origin of matter and antimatter annihilation. Because you know, the, the, the transition of the, from uh, particle and antiparticle into light was done through the so-called scattering, uh, scattering matrix, but was not an explanation of the mechanism of annihilation. You have to keep in mind that our perception of reality and our perception of time and the laws that govern our planet is extremely finite. It's not infinite. So like looking at a film strip, we see one picture at a time, uh, a whole instant can take the span of multiple pictures, but it's still a finite assessment of what happened in that film strip. So in addition, the charge conjugation has, has been uh, disproved 
by the, the uh, rather vast evidence that the earth has been devastated in the past, in the past by um, uh, antimatter asteroids that uh, the, um, such as the, the most famous of which has been the, 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 the 1908, uh, 1908 Tunguska explosion in Siberia that was the equivalent of 1,000 uh, Hiroshima nuclear bombs. Outer world beings, other entities that are outer worldly are not limited by uh, their possession or their, their, their ability to look at a single frame at a time. There may be millions of frames that take place in their span of time, along their timeline. The explosion was so strong that ionized the entire Earth to such an extent that people in, uh, in London, England, or in Sydney, Australia, the opposite side of Earth, could read the newspapers at midnight without any artificial light days are after the Tunguska explosion. Such an, an enormous uh, ionization of the entire Earth atmosphere can be um, quantitatively, scientifically, technically uh, uh, interpreted one way and one way only. That was caused either by a by nuclear explosion or by the annihilation in our atmosphere of an antimatter asteroid. So the perception and the orientation and the awareness of these individuals far go beyond our ability to understand or comprehend what happens in a, gi a given moment of time. Time itself is a relative thing. One second can be an eternity to another individual, depending upon how time works within their dimension. Because only those two, um, the, uh, the, those events can ionize the Earth in that dimension. Nuclear bombs were not available in 1908. Therefore, the only credible, because scientific and quantitative interpretation of the Tunguska explosion is that it was caused by the annihilation in our uh, upper atmosphere of a large antimatter asteroid. Now, the, 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 this is strong evidence of the existence of antimatter asteroid is in reality strong evidence in the existence of antimatter star and in actuality antimatter supernova that are necessary to create to create um, uh, antimatter asteroid. There have been several cases where artifacts and what looks like a UFO was picked up on infrared and um, completely eluded the uh, ability for human beings to see it with the naked eye. Uh, for instance, uh, such as the case in Mexico, where they tracked uh, several UFOs uh, on infrared that were not immediately seen by the naked eye. And as a result of that, the, um, the Air Force was scrambled and actually did see um, entities uh, with their infrared cameras that were not readily available. The charge conjugation is in the directly disproved, uh, at especially at the microscopic level, by the very existence of this catastrophic uh, event in Siberia. As a scientist, I could not ignore this evidence, and therefore, when I was at Harvard University in the early 1980s, I developed and proposed and developed the, 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 this new transformation from matter to antimatter, which I called isoduality. So now let's explore an aspect of light that goes into the wave aspect of the electromagnetic spectrum. The wave aspect of light determines a light's color, its frequency. You see, these cameras that are recording me right now and the cameras we use for infrared or thermography kind of work the same way as a regular camera. A regular camera uses red, green, and blue to create its image on a CMOS chip. Duality, because it's a conjugation, iso, to stress the, the, in the Greek sense of isostopos, namely preser pre preservation of the axiom used for matter, but are to conjugate it in an opposite uh, fashion. And, uh, and I prove that indeed the isoduality, first of all, is applicable at all levels, not only at the particle level, but also at the macroscopic level. The red aspect of light is the longest wave within the electromagnetic spectrum. It works within a 22 to 2800 Kelvin 
a scale of frequency to measure its color. The green wave is a medium wave that ranges between 4,000 and 4,800 Kelvin. It's a medium wave right in the middle between the red and the blue. The blue wave of light, its frequency is tight, it's short, and it hovers between 5,000 and 5,800 Kelvin. As it is the case uh, necessary to, to understand quantitatively the Tunguska explosion, but, um, and, and above all, the isodual uh, the, the transformation does indeed allow a quantitative representation of matter, antimatter annihilation. That is a representation with equations that uh, can be controlled by uh, verified with theorem and verified eventually with experiments. So these three aspects of light are very important, not just for photography or videography, but it is very important to how our brain works. You see, when you use a discrete time Fourier transform, which is basically what an engineer would use to measure point A to point B and transfer of light, these wave particles bounce off an object and go from its signature to our eye. U UFO um, have the capability, to my knowledge and documentation, have the capability of uh, emitting a variety of different light. We only mention two lights, namely emitting ordinary light, in which case we see them with our eyes and we can fill them with our optical instrument. Positive number one. So, when we look at the eye, we understand that light is transferred and reversed upside down to the retina. And through these opsins and cones, they're filtered through this transduction cascade. And these things are very sensitive to the red, green, and blue aspect of the electromagnetic spectrum. Possibility number two, the UFO have also the capability of emitting a light with a different index of refraction than that ordinary light, in which case we cannot see it with our eyes or film it with our optical instruments because all our eyes and all our optical instruments are based, are based on, uh, on, uh, on the conventional index of refraction of light that require convex lenses. I can't help but think of the color sky of the, the blue, which is the short wavelength and the three principal primary colors that the LGN processes. This is about 49 to 5600 degree Kelvin. The medium wavelength would be the green, which is 4800 Kelvin. The red aspect is the longest frequency wave. It works within a 21 to 3200 Kelvin scale. You see, Kelvin is a measurement of a light's color frequency wave. And many people in film or people that are watching us right now through this camera, the technologies work within the frequency gathering on a CMOS chip. And all instruments within cameras work on a red, green, and blue aspect of light. So when we go into this aspect of light, I want to explain very clearly how these wave structures kind of interpret into these interference patterns. Antimatter light or I should do a light in this case because it's not antimatter. UFO light is not antimatter light, even though UFO are believed to achieve propulsion by being able of extracting antimatter from space as, a, as the most sublime and uh, unbelievable realization of the zero point energy is maximized into, into, into UFO and allows interstellar, interstellar travel. But this is a different issue. Back to the, back to the, um, the point, is that uh, the, uh, again, if they emit uh, 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 the second type of light the, by, um, by, uh, uh, with a different uh, index of refraction, only light, right, then they are, uh, it cannot be detected by our uh, eyes because our eyes is, is convex iris. We need a concave iris. Our eyes has been created. This light and wave trigger a response within the optic chiasma that flutter and flow right to something that's called the LGN in the brain. This LGN has six structures within itself, the magnocellar and the parvocellar aspects of this longitudinalulate nucleus. It is dispersed, and Dr. Paul Blair, Dr. Scott McDermott, and I believe it's a triphase, biphase, and quadphase aspect of an optic radiation dispersal that goes to the back of the occipital lobe. Because what is written in the, the test book in physics regarding electromagnetic spectrum is only a minute fraction of what, in my opinion, is the real electromagnetic spectrum existing in nature. 
Notice that um, the, infra, the, the spectrum of electromagnetic, uh, of electro, uh, electromagnetic, so electromagnetic light is enormous. Despite its enormity, it's still a small fraction of what exists in nature, in my personal view. Once it goes to the occipital lobe, we believe the very you, whether you want to call it a soul energy or a soul, resides, like Dr. Prebram stated, inside the cerebral cortex. Uh, I saw dual, um, uh, a way to achieve invisibility by changing intent of refraction is only one. It's an engineering issue. You have um, $10 million, hire 20 smart engineers, tell them, change the characteristics of light. Please, here is a million dollars price for each of you. They will come up with a way to change the characteristic of light. I changed it in our laboratory, the frequency. So an engineer can change the in index of refraction in due time and with proper funds. Now, let's take a look at just how the human eye functions within the electromagnetic spectrum. This will give us a better understanding of how limited our sight perception is within the vastness of visible light. The human eye is comprised of opsins and phototransduction cascades that are found within the photoreceptors. We know that light frequencies range within the short, medium and long ranges in the electromagnetic spectrum. But I want to emphasize this is only part of the possibility of achieving invisibility. Another, um, another one that I have tested in laboratory as, um, is the following. In, um, and, and we had dinner, uh, lunch today with um, one of the technicians that was with us during this experiment. In one of the experiments I proved that the laser light passing through a very hot gas uh, experience what we call ISO blue shift, namely the frequency is shifted over the blue, namely light, the laser light acquires energy from the medium, from the hot medium, but therefore uh, uh, since acquired energy frequency has to increase. Well, there are also three classes of cone opsins. These three types of opsins react to specific wavelengths of light to which they are most sensitive. The short cones respond with this maximum stimulus to the blue region of the electromagnetic spectrum. The medium cones respond with maximum stimulus to the green region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Finally, the long cones respond with maximum stimulus to the red regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Jointly, we proved that the same light passing through a very cold, very cold, cold um, um, a cold sub-freezing, a cold medium at sub-freezing temperature loses energy to the medium, the medium gets hotter. Where is the energy coming for from the medium getting hot? It comes from the laser light. What happens when the laser light loses energy to warm up? They to, the frequency has to decrease, decrease necessarily without any motion. There's absolutely no Doppler effect whatsoever. Here is everything stationary. That's why it's called iso, um, iso um, redshift. It's not, not an iso Doppler. Now we know that opsins are G-protein coupled receptors. So attached to this receptor is a chromophore that derived from vitamin A. This light causes this chromophore to isomerize. This induces a conformational change in the opsins protein. So this really activates the G-protein known as transducin. Back to the issue of UFO, another an alternative possibility to achieve instantaneous invisibility with the technology of thousands of years beyond the, the stealth technology of the past is the following, that uh, the, the craft can, uh, is surrounded by, by gas and suppose this, um, this, this craft is, is, uh, has the capability of instantaneously increasing the, dramatically the temperature um, uh, of the gas, uh, of the plasma. The transducin then activates cyclic GMP phosphodiesterase, which decreases the levels of CGMP in the cone, which closes CGMP gated channels. This ultimately hyperpolarizes the photoreceptor. This hyperpolarization causes less glutamate to be released from the photoreceptor. So this either excites or inhibits the bipolar cell to which it is synaptically connected. So this is a very basic understanding of just how the human eye is limited to what light we can really detect in this electromagnetic spectrum. 
then as, as an increase of the temperature of the plasma surrounding the crust. The, the light cannot be destroyed, it's emitted, has to get out. But then it, it, go, it, it gets out instantaneously shifted all the, to the ultraviolet, but therefore achieving instantaneous invisibility. This is a second way of uh, achieving invisibility among many. And you say, well, Gary, this is really technical. This is really interesting, but what does this have to do with UFO phenomenon? Well, once again, I am laying down a basic understanding of how limited we really are to our surroundings to give us some clues as to how these phenomena might hide within the different areas of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this would give us a little understanding of how we cannot always detect them with our naked eye. If we are not alone in the universe, the implications for all mankind will be staggering. What do these extraterrestrial beings want with mankind? It's hard to answer a question like that because the answer has to take a context and you have to put it in a worldview that's consistent with what we know about the world. When other people went to college, I was passing a review on Warden Field at the Naval Academy. That gets in your blood. When I got to graduation, I had the standing to pick where I wanted to go, and the Air Force worked hard to recruit us, so I, went, I took my commission in the Air Force. And after I was through with my service in the Air Force, I was in the, the think tank world, the Rand Corporation world. I was in the intelligence community. To make a long story short, even as a professional executive, I found myself in the strategic arena for 30 years. I've served on 12 boards. I've been chairman and CEO of six different public companies, four of which were publicly traded defense contractors. I developed uh, this isodual technology, isodual optics, isodual telescope for a very specific purpose, that of uh, achieving for the, um, for the first time in history the detection of antimatter galaxies that are expected to be necessary for the stability of the universe. One night, uh, uh, the night of a cloudy day uh, that we could not um, test uh, the, the sky, we, um, we oriented uh, the pair of uh, Galileo and Santilli telescope uh, um, to our terrestrial environment and to our great uh, surprise with um, the telescope, the, uh, the Santilli telescope detected very sharp and very strong, uh, very strong uh, images uh, that were completely absent in the Galileo telescope. I remember when I was entering the Naval Academy, it was June of 52, that the UFOs shut down Washington National Airport and also Andrews Air Force Base there for a week. And they couldn't figure out why, because these things would come and interfere. They set up fighters and they disappeared. Come back. That went on for an, almost a week. I remember that because I was there at the time. No, these were real and they, saw, they, they showed up on multiple radars simultaneously. These are not hallucinations. When dealing with, um, with images uh, caused by, originating by entities in our atmosphere, it must be clarified immediately that the, those images are not created by antimatter uh, sources because any antimatter entity existing in our atmosphere will instantly annihilate with a catastrophic explosion. Therefore, it is, uh, the, as far as I know, according to all uh, plausibility or uh, otherwise credible evidence, the image of the, the, of the terrestrial entity are caused by craft, namely by craft composed by ordinary matter. It appears that, uh, that those uh, terrestrial entities are, uh, are craft capable of changing the, uh, the main characteristics of, uh, of the light that they emitted, which is, of course, the index of refraction, by therefore achieving instantaneous invisibility to our human eyes as well as to all optical equipment I am aware of. Now, what, are, what is the most plausible in origin of those uh, mysterious entities? I know the answer. And those entities, in my opinion, are UFO. The two most respected researchers in this field are, was J. Allen Hynek, the American, and Jacques Belay, the Frenchman. They devoted their lives to this. They were on the appropriate, they had the credentials and the background and the commitment. Both of them concluded that these things are not intergalactical, they're interdimensional. They also were convinced, and that surprised me, 
but because the, they didn't have the background for what I'm about to say, but they both claim they're demonic. But most likely, they 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 dis instantly disappear from our eyes by just changing the, the, the index of the refraction of the light that they emit. And in any case, we are talking about a technology which is thousands and thousands of years ahead of our very primitive 20th century human stealth technology of achieving partial invisibility to, the, to, the, to radar and other view by shapes. They are not beneficial, they're adversarial. They pretend to be things they're not. I'm cutting through a lot of writing that they did. So the point is, it's in that vein that the conclusion of Tom Horn and Chris Putnam, and I agree with that conclusion, is that what's being prepared here, cosmic delusion. I don't mean just that there's error or misinformation coming, no. There is a very specific lie that the world is going to embrace. Jesus warned about that, saying if it were possible, it would even deceive the very elect. Paul writes about it in 2 Thessalonians 2, that because they did not respond to the love of truth, God will give them over to the lie. I personally believe that those terrestrial entities are, are the UFO that have been seen by tens of tens of millions of, uh, of uh, people all over the world and indeed have a behavior that precisely corresponds to what indicated, namely the capability of instantaneous disappearing from, uh, from uh, view, as well as having a technology which is um, thousands and thousands of years I had our capability of conception at this moment. The abductions are serious problems. They're, they are very serious problems. John Mack, who was the psychiatrist at the Harvard Hospital, wrote a book on the abductions. He passed away here not too long ago, but his book, he had, I think, uh, 176 cases personally. And what he said, these are above average intelligence people with no prior trauma that obviously had subject to some experience, that the experiences are too bizarre to accept and yet too consistent to ignore. The holonomic of brain processing, or what is known as the holonomic brain theory, gives us some very interesting and provocative insight as to how we might really perceive our known universe. This holonomic model is developed by Dr. Carl Prebram and physicist David Bohm. Now, Bohm worked very closely with Albert Einstein while at Princeton University. Working with Einstein gave Bohm a great deal of insight about multidimensional theories. And he co-chaired a conference on the subject at MIT and is attended by, of course, people that are professional counselors, psychiatrists, psychologists, whatever, that are troubled by this bizarre stuff that's going on. He challenged them. He said, if what these people are saying happened to them isn't happening, what is? Because of the consistency of the things, it would appear that the purpose of the abductions is to, to, to indulge in experimentation regarding the human reproductive system. They're abusive. There are people around that have been badly abused by experiences they can't explain. This holonomic model of human cognition would demonstrate that the brain sort of functions as a 3D or 4D holographic storage drive within this huge neural network. And so Bohm used quantum mechanics and mathematic principles to study a variety of wave patterns to demonstrate this theory. It takes on a whole bunch of related issues. One of the issues is astrobiology. That's, uh, science is the investigation of evidence. The problem with astrobiology, there is no evidence. It's a science with no evidence at all. Don't confuse wishful thinking with evidence. But they deal with that very well, very scholastically. They also, one of the most difficult subjects to, to talk and think about is this whole area of UFOs. So let's say you dropped a pebble in the water. What you would see, obviously, is effects of this impact. You would see these ripples of water, these amplitudes, cascade outward and diminish over space and time. Now, if you took two pebbles and dropped them into the very same water, what you see is something kind of interesting. 
you would see these ripples from two different impact points collide with each other. These ripples would then interact with one another, creating very interesting patterns within the water. These patterns are the coefficients, the numbers that represent these amplitudes of the waves that reinforce or diminish each other. This is what Dr. Prebram and David Bohm would refer to as interference patterns. Most people don't take them seriously because they, for good reason, because there's so much nonsense, so many deliberate hoaxes and so on and so forth. That's what makes it hard to research. But if you cut through all that, you'll be shocked to discover there are thousands of authenticated, serious events. So this hologram is a set of interference patterns between these ripples. These interference patterns may be key into understanding how the human mind functions as a hologram. So what we are addressing here is how the mind interprets and translates these aspects of light within the visible and non-visible areas of this huge, vast electromagnetic spectrum. And so when we delve into these areas of these UFO phenomenon, it is really key for us to understand just how limited our ability to perceive this whole vastness of our universe really is. But at the same time, the Vatican is expecting to receive an alien visitor. What do you make of any of that? I think there's just a huge delusion coming. But the point, of, the reason I even mention it though, is to be aware of the fact that there are serious scholars that, ha that believe, that doesn't mean they're right, but they believe that the current Pope has a prophetic role here. But what they may or may not know is that the Vatican has openly admitted that they're preparing to receive an alien visitor. Now, the human brain has a mass weight of about three pounds. This small neural computer operates on just 12 watts of power that uses an energy source supplied by glucose. In addition, this holographic network uses almost 25% of oxygen that is supplied to our entire body. So, when we take a close look at the human brain, we see a complicated web of capillaries that span over 400 miles in length. These capillaries supply oxygenated blood to the synaptic network that is comprised of about 86 billion neurons. So, each one of these single neurons has massive branches that connect with other neurons. This complex branching makes about 5,000 to 10,000 connections per neuron. This is a vast network that comprises more than 500 trillion connections. The center of astronomy today is no longer Palomar in California, the Hale Telescope. The big stuff today is at Mount Graham in the southeastern corner of Arizona. And that's where the University of Arizona itself manages a double telescope, a binocular telescope that's twice the size of Palomar. There's also up there a, a very, very key radio telescope. But there's a third facility on Mount Graham that is run by the Vatican. So. These 86 billion neurons fire at a rate of about 200 times per second. Such a plethora of activity is capable of over 17 trillion action potentials. You must really understand that this is a 10 quadrillion calculation per second computer system that is stored inside your cranium. Now let's put this into a great perspective. If you took a piece of brain matter the size of a grain of sand, only the size of a grain of sand, this small piece of brain matter would contain around 100,000 neurons. This has a branching highway of over 2 million axons that can fire off over 1 billion synapses. Remember, this is all occurring within the piece of brain matter that is the size of one grain of sand. We have a, a well-trained staff. Jesuits, but they're very, very technology uh, sophisticated. And uh, there are debates going on in the Vatican regarding the uh, baptizing of an alien. Can, you know, and there's issues. If he's, is he not sinless? Is he sent you know, all that? They, 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 they've decided for whatever, at least tentatively, that he's, he's baptizable.
as you can see here at the VLA, we are doing some very different things that will span the whole area of the electromagnetic spectrum. This VLA uses 24 array radio telescopes with interferometry spectrums that go into the vast aspect of the electromagnetic spectrum. The VLA does not condone, nor does it in any way, shape, or form endorse this documentary that's going through a span of different ideas of what these UFO things might be. But we are showing what the VLA does. This is quite staggering. Once again, you might say, well, Gary, this is all interesting and this is phenomenal, but what does this really have to do with these UFO phenomenon? Well, let's delve into an aspect of future computing known as quantum computing. We can see that a huge amount of processing power can work within an area of the size of a grain of rice. As a scientist, I uh, felt the duty to report them in a, in a, in a paper published in a referee journal with a variety of at least some of the some of the, uh, the photographic evidence, but I have to confess that in reality I do not know what those um, what those images are. I, I indicated uh, as a genetic terms that are due to um, I call them uh, uh, the generic term of IT, uh, IT. What if I were to tell you that it is possible to create a computer system where everything on the computer is holographically derived? The motherboard, the GPU, the CPU, the logic board, all of the hardware is a holographic, derived and recognized system. Then the extrapolation mechanism of this computer is another wavelength of light, another hologram, that can fully read all of the data from the original holographic structure. This is a hologram reading a hologram. This is an exchange of wavelengths or particles reading each other. Well, this is a technology that is very real and very secret within the confines of our government. But what if I were to tell you that there is the slightest possibility that this exists within the UFO phenomenon? What then might we be facing? The scientists examined something called the Planck measurement, which is 10 to the minus 35 centimeters, extremely small subatomical measurement. At that point, particles and atoms cease to exist and function in a typical fashion. We lose its ability to function. We call this non-locality. There's another theory of what we call quantum entanglement, which is the building block of quantum physics. Molecules and atoms that form them do not behave in a typical fashion. The particle aspect of light is assigned an entangled counterpart. This entangled particle knows what the other particle is doing and changes instantaneously in action to the other particle's properties. However, this also changes and affects the properties of the wave in light that this particle is representing. So, you could have graphic images that are projected in light, and these graphic images are the data processes. They are the entangled particles. This is a massive ocean of symphonic awareness that breaks all boundaries of our technological capabilities. It would be like having a holographic motherboard, a holographic RAM, holographic GPU and CPU, and even a holographic logic board, all composed of light. Even though um, alien life form may uh, perceive uh, different dimensionality and different use of light, the applicability of AI is still the same. AI is artificial intelligence that is based on the initial learning from the life form that creates it. So AI, even the alien life form, will have to begin at the understanding of that alien life form in order to initiate some understanding at a technology level. There are no physical parts of this computer. It is though one wavelength of light is reading another wavelength of light, or one particle light is reading this holographic wave of light. So when you stop to consider these possibilities, these very theories, then you can begin to see the basic clues that may show us how these UFO entities manipulate time, space, and their own computing. How they actually travel through space and gather data in some quasi-form of holographic dimensional computing systems. 
Well, it is my opinion that uh, the, the, the origin of the, 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 the energy uh, used in the UFO is originates from the ether. Again, if they travel through the interstellar, interstellar space, they could not carry the, the necessary fuel with them. But it would be bigger than our solar system. No, they must extract the energy during their travel. There is one way and one way only to extract that um, energy during interstellar travel, and that is by extracting energy from the ether. Scientists have determined that electromagnetic rivetics is a field of study where it appears that magnetic energy can cancel out gravitational fields. The far-reaching implication is so extreme that it baffles the mind. Now, this extraction of, extraction of energy from the ether has many, many names. For instance, as zero-point energy. But the point is the extraction of energy from, uh, from the space. Um, I showed to you an equipment which, is an, um, uh, which we call a directional neutron source is an equipment producing the synthesized neutrons on demand. This electromagnetic gravitics creates a spectrum of energy that goes into the TRB3 and allows it to amplify in such a way that it creates its own energy field. It's absolutely stunning from a scientific point of view, what's going on. Now, when we're dealing with the area of UFO technologies, we have to divide these technologies into different categories. You have gravity amplifiers, which are waveguides or microwave horns. You have Omicron configurations that are using one amplifier, delta configurations that are using all three amplifiers for both space travel, one amplifier for lifting the craft, and two amplifiers that point it in front to create a distortion wave. UFOs phase shifts the gravity waves that can move in and out of our reality. It's an equipment producing the synthesized neutrons on demand, and uh, by pushing the button, synthesized neutrons on demand from the hydrogen, namely compressing the electron inside the proton and creating the neutron according to Rutherford, not according to the standard mole. And my God, then because the neutron then decays exactly the same particle that the original uh, synthesized in the which is proton and direct. This TRB3 uses zero-point energy, which is fueled by element 115 to create an energy source of its own. This is extraordinary in terms of atom and matter and electrons functioning on a subatomic nature to create their own propulsion, their own energy. The craft creates its own gravitational field and then the inertia has no effect on the craft. You are in the distortion wave. So gravity distorts time and space. The g-forces have no effect on those that are working within the craft. Then you're dealing with the theory of gravitons. Gravity bends space and distorts time. We can see the stars that are behind the sun because sun's gravity bends light of the stars behind the sun so we can see it. Gravity can shorten time distance with the bending of space. The TRB3 is sort of like a triangle where a pole is on each corner. It generates its energy in such a way that the TRB3 creates its own energy with this tri-matrix component that allows it to generate its own, its own energy and its own gravity. Element 115 is known as Muscovium. This is a very stable element that has a very stable isotope. Muscovium has a mass number of 290. The nucleus of the atom is geometrically stable with protons and neutrons where it no longer decays or is radioactive. So, the particle accelerator will aim at element 115. It then causes reaction radiation emission, or antimatter, that goes through a thin tube to react to the gas. When matter and antimatter react, it creates energy. Then this is heated energy which creates the power. The TRB3 uses the three amplifiers to achieve pitch, yaw, and access control. So it can hover, move in all aspects of space and actually elevate as well as velocity 
and propulsion. Reactors also set up gravitational waves from element 115 being bombarded or guided through tubes to amplified cavities and projectors that are found at the bottom of these UFOs. Their thermionic generator is 100% efficient, which is in violation of the first law of thermodynamics. It is where we get zero-point energy. Dr. Carl Prebram and David Bohm worked really closely on their studies of holography. And Dr. Prebram stated very clearly that without the convex lenses in our eyes and the cameras and our gear and our telescopes, we would see our reality as nothing more than a blur. We would see a holographic spread function within our holographic reality. And that XYZ aspect of that spread function contains all the data of the image that is within that aspect of light. But when we use the convex lenses in our eyes, it brings into form, or what he would state, information, our reality. My main interest is to look into how these UFO phenomena use their blue shift electrogravitic technologies to hide the wave aspect of light and the particle aspect of light within this dispersal spread function and our holographic reality. This is exactly what Dr. Santilli was talking about when he stated and created this, this concave telescope that can bypass this hidden spread function to actually see how the particles and how these UFOs change the index refraction of light so our eyes cannot see them within those different areas of the electromagnetic spectrum. On behalf of Dr. Missler, Dr. Santilli, Dr. McDermott, Paul Blair, and myself, I really hope that we were able to give you clear and concise descriptions of how quantum mechanics, particle physics, and the holonomic brain theory demonstrate how limited our perceptions are to these UFO phenomena. I really hope that this would evoke a sense of wonder and excitement for you to go out there, do your own research, and draw from that reliable conclusions. My name is Gary Cole. Always remember the truth is out there, but it's up to you to go and find it.